Hello and welcome to Media MD, your fortnightly doof network dose of media that you have somehow missed. I'm Ruben Morehouse. And I'm Elliot Diebold. I'm still getting used to that new intro, Elliot. Welcome to all our doof our doof friends who are just <laughs> checking out the show for the first time. Last episode didn't count, that wasn't a main series episode, but this one's canon. We're talking about the Flintstones. Yes. Uh, and so, as is tradition, we start with a plot summary. And, um, <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> what the fuck are you even going to do? Um, I mean, it, there's not really a, 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 like a, a plot that carries over these. There's twelve issues of, of this yeah. Flintstones comic, um, and each one sort of uh, like a, its own little episodic story. Like there's some there's some tie overs, but uh, more or less each one sort of has a, a theme or, or story to it, and it tells that. Mm-hmm. And they're all just weird slices of life in this uh, capitalist dystopian nightmare of uh, bedrock. <laughs> yeah, of the distant, very, very distant past. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, as you sort of touched on in your prescription, I mean, this is like a weird, like, satire of of modern uh, civilization and politics, but for yeah. some reason set in, in prehistoric times. <laughs> but, like, I think that works because, uh, like, it, it's these dumbass con- like you know the the prehistoric versions of the modern issues are used really well to like kind of highlight how dumb it is yeah um, one of the things i really like about it is the characters like because some of these things that they're dealing with are so regressive it kind of makes sense like mm. one of the first few issues is about um a new group of neanderthals coming to town and it's very clearly kind of uh, talking about anti-immigrant sentiment, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And and the characters that are kind of having the the fairly middle of the road uh, reactions, where they're like, "No, these are just people. Like, why are we freaking out about this?" Th- they seem progressive amongst society of regressives that are, I guess, <laughs> living literally in the past. So I think it makes sense as a satirical like concept. Yeah, well, and they've also got this device where uh, civilization has been created within the last five years. Yeah. Uh, and, and so everything is new. So there's this opportunity to challenge every part of civilization, which is sort of what they do over the 12 things. And, and it's asking, like, right, because all the characters are in a position to ask, why are things like this? Because they were all hunter gatherers like five years ago. Mm. Uh, like, yeah. In a really kind of weird way, there were bits of this that reminded me of Sapiens. Yeah, I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> um, like, yeah, it's a very, very loose connection, but there's some bits that were just sort of like, oh, yeah, okay, wait, it's very Sapiens. Um, mm. But yeah, like, I mean, I like, I quite, I quite liked the format of this. If anything, I feel like comics made it too short. Like, I would, I would love to see this converted to like ten minute shorts like i feel mm. like you'd get a lot more out of each some kind of story. animated cartoon perhaps <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um but this flintstones are not actual flintstones yeah um was i was mean there was some great little to the actual flintstones i've never actually watched it so i like maybe i imagine there probably what... was yeah but nowhere near on this level right if that makes sense like yeah. i imagine it was it was a lot more underhanded and, and less uh important to the main theme but yeah i don't know um, yeah, I never I mean, watched it, so this is the Flintstones to me, the one. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there are some great little Easter eggs spread throughout these of, like, uh, the original Flintstones animation used as, like, diagrams for the others <laughs> that I noticed. Yeah. Um, so that, so those, those were nice little, wait, that was something I did consciously try to do was look at the art and there were nice little visual gags spread throughout the, the comic books, which was mm. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, uh, let's talk about the, the humor, right? Because this isn't just a social satire. It's, I, I think, quite a funny, uh, comic. Um, yeah, I mean, almost all that humor is usually coming from, like, a place of satire. Like, it, like, it's, it's funny satire, I, I would think. Like, I, I'm struggling to think of anything I laughed out loud at that wasn't, you know, someone, or that wasn't part of a satirical joke. Mm. I, I, they do have... Uh, maybe this is kind of satire, maybe not. It kind of blurs the line a bit for me, but they do have kind of jokes that are just like the visual gag kind of things where it's some modern day thing, but uh, redone <laughs> as a piece of bedrock technology, oh, which yeah. is a classic. No, you're right. Yeah, I was I was counting the visual gags uh, separately from what you were saying, but no, absolutely. Mm. Like uh, some of the names of the places, like they go to what is clearly a target and it's called Tar Pit. Um <laughs> uh, lots of like puns like that they're all pretty good yeah 
and just a bunch of things that are kind of ridiculous, yeah. but make sense in universe. Like I'm, I've just opened it to a random page and I'm looking and there's a guy, it's Barney actually, and he's uh, fighting with a gorilla yep. <laughs> in their army training. Like, oh, that's just a normal <laughs> thing that you would do, I guess, is fight against a gorilla. There's to one, train in the army. I think it's in one of the last two uh, issues where there's like a radar dish that they got to use. And the radar dish is just like a brontosaurus with a dish stuck around the base of its neck. <laughs> and and so like it's it's neck and head is like yeah. the middle part of the radar dish or, which i thought was hilarious yeah um yeah so you're right yeah. like there's just lots of dumb shit like that and it really adds to that ar- ambience of like what the books are going for which is this is a civilization that, that makes no sense and you know really they're talking about a lot of our <laughs> civilization uh and and you know yeah. so it's all like you know that's it's very cohesive yeah um let's touch on uh the part of the book that isn't really satire because Every so often, there's a, a little part of it which is just telling the story of the appliances that live inside the Flintstones' house. Oh, man. Like, so yeah, spoilers for what? Uh, yeah, spoilers for the whole thing. <laughs> okay. The bit where Vacuum Cleaner died was mm. fucking tragic. I I was very upset. Yeah. Uh, like, just, just after he'd gone and saved Bowling Ball. <laughs> and then- Man, this this conversation must make no sense if you haven't yeah. read. You you um, should read it. Like I would, <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, I'd recommend it. Right, that's the whole point of the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but no. So uh, I think you touched on this in the prescription. But like, e- everything is an animal, and that's something that they like to talk about a lot. Like to to frame this thing about how humans abuse the environment and and each other and stuff. It's like all the appliances are living things. Like even like lamps. Yeah. Uh, and they all sort of get together and hang out at night while the humans are sleeping. <laughs> yeah, it's very uh, Toy Story. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the whole bit where they are, uh, where they go and rescue Bowling Ball, like where where Vacuum Cleaner leads that mission, was yeah. very Toy Story one. Like, uh, I was yeah. actually like, oh, uh, like all, to the point where I thought that was an intentional like thing they might have been going for. Um, yeah, yeah, but like uh, some of the advice <laughs> bits are, are pretty great. Yeah, R.I.P. R. I. P. Um, it's Vacuum tragic, Cleaner. isn't it? Um, the, I, I just opened to the bit where, and the thing about the vacuum cleaner dying is it's kind of, we, we're not in one of these sections where the humans don't exist that we find out the vacuum cleaner has died because, um, I've forgotten her name. Wilma. Is it Wilma? Yeah. Um, yeah. The wife. It's like, yeah. oh, no. Fred gets home and he says, hi, honey, I'm home. What's going on here? And Wilma says, oh, nothing. The vacuum cleaner died, I'm afraid. And. And then we see the bo- we see bowling ball's reaction, and it's yeah. heartbreaking. And then, um, and then they just throw it out. I think, like, yeah. Cause it's, the, cause you it's see just a, a thing on the next page. You see a little pink uh, trunk peeking out of the trash can. <laughs> um, and, and this is what, something I want to kind of a general point I want to talk about for this uh, comic is it's not it, it doesn't feel like they're they're. Uh, you know straw men used to make satirical points there's no overarching plot really but it does feel like there's a lot of um heart in it i suppose which i think is so important when you're trying to make a point because nobody cares about a point being made by by two scarecrows acting at each other like there needs to be an actual humanity underlying whatever the message is um oh yeah for sure i mean the most sympathetic characters are the appliances yeah um yeah and and I think, but but I do think that does apply to to Fred and Wilma as well, right? Like they, yeah, definitely. Like Fred and Wilma are usually the two who um, at least align most to my general take on the world. Um, mm. The the sort of like the, the ones who have the more modern perspective on things. Like Fred is the one arguing for not treating the Neanderthals like shit because they're different. Uh, yeah, for example, like you know, it's um. They're definitely sort of the two most uh, sympathetic ones, um, but, I but think. not just in that they they are sympathetic, but like you know, part of I think the second uh, trade is is I keep wanting to call her Velma, but it's not Wilma. Um, <laughs> is Wilma's like struggle to become an artist, and that's that's there is a there is some like satire of of uh, like art criticism modern art criticism and and modern art in general and stuff um but but it is like a story about her being willing to you know pursue a a a creative passion of hers and try and make it into a job um and that's a very like human relatable thing right 
Yeah, well, I mean, there are a number of issues that tackle, like, modern capitalism pretty directly, and, and yeah. that was sort of one of those threads. Yeah. Um, one of the weird standouts to me was the issue where they talk about how they started civilization by killing all the tree people, mm. and there's this sort of under undercurrent story of uh, how Fred and, um, oh, what's his friend's name? Barney. Barney, yeah. Uh, how Fred and Barney decided to, like, start their families and and we see that like barney's struggling and then he it like it turns out his son that he has is is actually like the last tree person after they committed genocide there was one left and yeah uh, and barney basically took it home and that's their son now and it's never really brought up anywhere else in the story but it's this nice touching moment like mixed into the the sort of uh like horror story of how their civilization got off the ground yeah and it's interesting because you know they're they're kind of like (laughs) <laughs> the story of their civilization is born out of genocide and this is something that they're coming to terms with like it's such a like i love i love this conceptually because it lets them tackle so many cool things right mm-hmm. like yeah. how, how how else would you do that story if not in something like the flintstones where you can make these uh situations occur and not have it be like something that completely ruins the tone of the rest of the book yeah yeah i'd, I'd agree no. Yeah. Uh, um, anyway, I love yeah. it. I love it. I, I, I yeah, know. I mean, I like. I'm. I'm. I don't just want to pick through all the examples, like the mayoral election where they, uh, where they elect like uh, what is it, Claude the Claude the Destroyer or whatever, and, and all <laughs> yeah. the funny stuff they do with him for a, the rest of the a series. A lot of fun religion stuff as well. Um, people yes. trying to figure out what religion should be, <laughs> like <laughs> struggling to, and and of course because you know modern religion has so many. Things that are basically just tradition at this point, right? People trying mm. to come to the point of like, well, why don't we have this be a tradition? And they're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would we yeah. do that? <laughs> it's great. Y- yeah, it, it's it's pretty great. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, they're doing the same thing with, with so many other aspects of it as well. It's yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um. So one of the sharpest social satires around in and out of comics, Elliot, Hollywood Reporter. Yeah. Um. I mean, like, yeah, I, I, I guess I agree with that. I'm like, I'm not. I, I was trying to think of what other super sharp social satires I can think of. Mm. Um, nothing's jumping into my mind. Maybe so, the good yeah, fight. I, mean, <laughs> I guess that's not really a well, satire. No, um, more just a critique. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely do feel like my enjoyment of this was hampered by the fact it was a comic oh, book. God I did still it. enjoy it. <laughs> um, One of these days, Elliot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but like, I just. As I was reading it, as I said, I couldn't help but think like, oh, this would be so much better if it was a cartoon or mm. or something. Um, mm. Yeah. I just, I you know, I, I you got to move your eyes too much for comic books. That's what it is. <laughs> it's just it's just little segmented speech bubbles spread out too much. Like either just give me lines of text or like a screen with, with audio. I don't know. Mm. Um, but don't you I think, feel I like it's just- some of these jokes just wouldn't work if they were a cartoon? Like... I don't know. I, I'm looking through it, and I'm, I'm up to a bit where the aliens are here on spring break, and they're basically just fucking shit up. Um, if you haven't read the story, that, that'll sound like nonsense again, but, you know, check it out. <laughs> um, and it's like, it's... Some of this action is so, uh, I don't know, like, eccentric and strange that I feel like it just wouldn't work as well as a cartoon. Um... I mean, I, I don't feel that way, but mm. um, maybe I just wasn't paying enough attention to the gags. I'm trying to find that now. It's like two or three issues in, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you're right. I, I, I think it's just me. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, it, I think I said this when we talked about the Hawkeye stuff. Like, I feel like as I'm reading these and I'm not getting as into them because they're comic books, it doesn't feel like it's the comic book. It feels like it's me and like it's being wasted on me, not the other way around. Mm. Mm. I think there is an argument to be made that um, that the the level of reaching a quality level of writing and production quality with a comic is uh, is more able to be done without a huge budget than uh, doing an animation uh, or something. Yeah, no, I did. I did sort of think of that. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a good way gateway type thing, and it's definitely like cheaper, uh, mm. and that's why you see a lot of. TV shows get continued in comic book form. Uh, mm. it's, it's much cheaper to do. Yeah, I guess. I yeah, as, as I was saying before, I just don't like jumping between the speech bubbles. I don't know. Like for <laughs> me, it just it just breaks. I, I I can't get a good momentum as I read through comics. I think that's yeah. what it is. I I haven't read enough to find 
find my rhythm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just have to bring you more comics. Scooby Apocalypse <laughs> is sitting on my desk right now, and uh, that'll probably so, make its way over to you. So, what did you say? Something Apocalypse? Scooby Apocalypse. Post apocalyptic oh, yes, Scooby Doo. That. That's part of the same uh, Hanna Barbera universe, right? Well, it's they're not really a shared universe. It's just the same kind of conceit of reviving Hanna Barbera cartoons as um as well. It could comics. be it could be a shared universe. They're like a hundred thousand years apart or whatever. Like. That's true. And actually, I'm realizing now for the first time at the very top of the Flintstones comic, it says Hanna Barbera universe. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe that is a thing. It doesn't say that oh. on the Scooby Apocalypse ones though. Yeah, you're right. It does say that on my own. Maybe that's where the idea came from. Mm. Um, anyway anyway yeah um anything else you want to say about the flintstones elliot um no i don't think so like yeah um i think i think we've pretty much covered it i i did i did quite like it uh i would have liked it more if it wasn't a comic book but that's not its fault that's mine i'm gonna I, um, one of these days elliot i'm gonna i've got saga sitting on my my sitting in my bookshelf maybe that's the one maybe that'll be the one i don't know what that means you, um uh, i'll get you <laughs> i'll get you one of these days <laughs> okay, um, so to give this one a number, I'm going to give it a, a 7 out of 10. Mm. Um, show me show me the cartoon version, it'll probably go higher than that, but uh, All right. like, I definitely, like, <laughs> most people don't have this issue with comic books, and so I would definitely recommend this to, to other people. Okay. Um, it is, it is very, like, it, it was funny. It, it is just very funny mm. uh, and clever. All right. <sighs> I, I'm gonna. I swear to God, you're, for you it's kids movies. For me, it's comic books. <laughs> I go. I'm gonna break you into this subgenre. I is it kids movies? That was one time. Uh, all right. Anyway. Um. In fact, I would argue it's not kids movies, but mm. uh, it is sci-fi because it's Elliot's first recommendation of the year, and that means it's time for science fiction oh, TV. I do like science fiction TV. Um. I think I'm on a pretty mixed success ratio with with this segment so far. Um. <laughs> because <laughs> i brought the expanse one year yeah that was good uh, obviously yeah and then the other two were x files and uh stargate sg1 which were mixed successes i, I feel um, like sg1 was more of a success than x files yeah I, I thought so too but mm. um anyway let's see let's see if i can uh what is it if i can do well is it Farscape? Bringing, no i i would love to bring that but there's no way you'd enjoy it <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I would love, I would love the opportunity to yeah. talk about Farscape on here, but like, I'm not going to waste You're your becoming time. Becoming more self-aware, Elliot. I have not reached <laughs> that point with comic books yet. <laughs> um, no, I am bringing you uh, Fox's 2009 sci-fi drama Dollhouse. Oh, this is the one that uh, w- w- some Whedons are behind, right? Yes, and, and uh, so let's just get that out of the way. I mean, this is often called Joss Whedon's Firefly. Um, but, I mean, at least you, Ruben, and maybe some of our listeners will know that for quite a few years now, I have been standing on a hill uh, just about alone saying that Jed Whedon and Marissa, his wife, mm-hmm. are the best Whedons. Yep. Um, uh, no, I'll stand with you on that. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has proven that to me. Yes, but, well, I, yeah, I mean, I guess I was standing on that hill alone in, like, 2012 before S.H.I.E.L.D. even started. Uh, okay. um, and, and now and that Joss... They- what, so what did they do? I don't really know what they've done apart from S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, well, so they were the driving force behind Dr. Horrible, really. Uh, okay. um, like, like Joss was involved, obviously, but uh, they, they wrote the music and played the instruments and sung some of the songs. Mm. So like that was the real juice of Dr. Horrible. Yep. Uh, and then they were a big part of Dollhouse, which is which is why it's one of my favorite of these, uh, you know, the Joss Whedon shows on paper. And I remember being very, like, it, it was really Dollhouse that led me to come to this conclusion that Jed and Marissa were like the best after i found out <clears throat> what they'd done for this and dr horrible and then finding out shield that they were really going to be the people behind it and joss mm. was, joss was really just a name when they put him on uh agents of shield and they dropped that after a year or two which was good yep um but yeah so so jed and marissa are, uh they're both writers on this and in fact they really carry uh both the season finales which hopefully you'll get to at least one of those because uh I mean, yeah, those are what those are what first first brought Jed and Marissa specifically to to my attention. Mm. Um, and yeah, so I mean, to, obviously, I think you've heard of Dollhouse. Like, what do you like know they're, going they're like in? Robots. It's like life model decoys. And I'm just saying it because I just <laughs> recently watched the finale of this season of Shield. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, so so close, not not quite. Basically, there's a uh, corporation that has uh, invented the technology to basically wipe people's brains and then reprogram them with new uh custom personalities oh so they're not robots uh, no they're they're real people and of oh. course these people uh this corporation does what any smart person would do when they've oh, invented no. this technology which is open a brothel oh, no. um 
So, yes, so the dolls uh, are basically people who have had their minds wiped and are now, um, you know, hired out to, I, to rich people. I don't want to ask. I'm sure this is going to be answered by the show, but is this a thing that they opt into or is this a... Uh, I don't want to know the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is addressed. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I will sort of say, like, obviously this show deals with pretty heavy uh, identity stuff as well as um obviously there's there's sexual stuff because primarily uh the dollhouse is a brothel they do a lot of yeah. other things as well which really adds a lot of variety to the show um mm. but at, at the end of the day that's generally uh the dollhouse's primary thing and, and so it does come up I'd, I'd like to think they're not overly gratuitous or, yeah. or anything with it is but this it's show obviously a drag how much of no. a drag no, so like, I, I don't think like I I sat down to rewatch the first three episodes for this, and I'm now at ten episodes in. Um, so I've been I've been sucked right back in, and I don't I don't think it like there's there's a couple of bits where it's definitely heavy, but it never felt like it was overdoing it. Okay, um, that's good. That's reassuring. It's, um, it's pretty, you know, like, as we say, we, you know, Marissa was one of the the writers, and then obviously the star Eliza Dushku is uh, a producer as well. So I think you know having having women in those positions as well helps you know stop it from from becoming you know one of those things where women are just sort of um you know like, like that's something that's thrown at game of thrones a lot how right. w- uh women's character arcs are often driven by sort of sexual exploitation and i, yeah. I don't think there's that much of that in here <laughs> yeah i i think that's something that you could think about but uh, like i don't know like i i have enough trust that the, if you're going to make a show about people and presumably a fair amount of women who are you know workers in sex workers who have had their minds wiped i wouldn't expect it to be like yeah check out how hot this is like mm, yeah. i i would i trust uh these these two weedens at least not to not to do that yeah um and, and so obviously like, as i sort of mentioned the the show stars eliza dushku which i, I don't know if you've seen her i just much. googled her and i didn't recognize her face so okay um well so she was the interesting thing about Dollhouse is it was actually offered to her. So the show, Fox actually contracted a show starring Eliza Dushku. That was how it started. Is They mm. they went to her and said, we want you in a show. And then she met up with Joss Whedon for lunch. And that was when they decided on the concept for Dollhouse. Interesting. And so can, it wasn't a pre-existing concept. Um, no, like it was it was sort of based on some, some various ideas, both yeah. of them brought to the table. But I mean, you can sort of see from an, actor's perspective like what a great opportunity because she gets to play a different character every episode because she's one of the actives uh or one of the dolls okay so she she has a different personality in print every episode so it's like a great Ah. great way for her to flex her muscles uh you know in that regard because she she's a different character every episode um it's great um so it was a a great opportunity for her it's a a shame it got cancelled after only two seasons Mm. um but yeah, I mean, I guess the two other things I quickly want to say about this uh, before I let you add it is uh, it has a bit of a slow start. Like it feels very, what, rewatching the first three episodes, it felt very network TV-ish, mm. um, but that quickly goes away, I promise, um, once it <laughs> once it gets the ball rolling. All right. You know, um, you know, Jen Marissa had the same thing with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., so I guess that's yep. just, that's just something they run into. Um, and then also, wait, don't, I guess this isn't really a problem with our format, but I had a lot of friends who watched this as it was airing and hated it. Like, it is not a show that does well on, like, week-to-week watching. I think you really have to sort of... And especially, well, I mean, when it was airing as well, it got thrown around, like, episodes are out of order and stuff. But, like, oh, really, God. when you sit down and when you sit down and watch it as a serialized story, it's mm. a lot better. Um, was it... Are there, like, interesting bits that you want to keep in mind? Or, like, what's the motivation? Yeah, definitely. Like, it, there's... It's uh, it's one of those stories where there's sort of like it's fairly episodic, but each episode is sort of or uh, ties very much into the overarching plot that's going mm. on. Um, so you know, like, uh, Echo is going out. E- so Echo's Eliza Dushku, uh, the main oh, character. Okay. Uh, Echo is going out on like you know the engagement of the week, but it ties thematically into what is going on at the dollhouse. Like there's sort of an overarching series of events going on at the dollhouse that drives the main plot of the show and obviously her being part of that house being sent out ties into that a lot we've gotten... probably, that that may that may not make much sense <laughs> yeah. but it'll make sense when you see it <laughs> we've gotten to the point of the prescription that we reach about half half of episodes i would say where the format of the show 
it just makes no sense to me anymore. Like, I mean, the format of, <laughs> of Dollhouse. Like, I'm thinking it's episodic and she has a new personality each week, but there's an overarching plot. I'm just thoroughly confused now, so I think I'd better just go watch it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, what you just said to me is is accurate and how I would describe it. So, like, if that makes no sense, then maybe it makes no sense without context. Yeah. Maybe you can maybe you can update it to make more sense in two weeks. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back with a, a, better, <laughs> a better explanation in two weeks. <laughs> yeah um i guess that's the end of our show elliot i'm excited to go yeah. watch this now this is something that has been on my on my eventually list for a while so i'm glad that it's uh it's time to <laughs> check it out um thanks for thanks for checking it out with us folks if you want to if you're going to check out dollhouse with us actually why don't you leave us your comments uh by shooting us an email which is uh, our email address is mediamdpodcast at gmail.com. But you can also check out our Twitter, which is at mediamdpodcast. Also, the, one of the best ways to, to chat to us about the uh, prescriptions as we're discussing it is the Doof Discord, uh, which is a, a kind of group chat thing where we talk about all things media, including uh, Dollhouse um, and hopefully Flintstones. Um, the place to get access to that is through our Patreon. Patreon. Uh, patrons at $1 and up have access to the Discord. You can find out more info at patreon.com slash doofmedia. Yeah, and that'll definitely, I think, be the place to be to, to you know, for those of you who've seen Dollhouse and, and want to jump in with some full spoilers. Ta- spoiler chat tag that, that please. Will, yeah. you know, spoiler tags. Um, yeah, uh, we can do that. And then also, you know, if, if Ruben and anyone else who's going to watch it for these two weeks, are, uh, you know, they can jump in there and, and you know, uh, talk talk about it as they're watching i guess yeah. um yeah uh so yeah uh also if you'd like why not leave us a review on itunes uh search for media md and uh and hit that five star button i guess is that what people say yeah probably yeah just... smash smash the five stars <laughs> <laughs> subscribe and smash those five stars um <laughs> we talk about a fair amount of things but uh the place to find links to all of them the patreon the twitter uh places to leave us comments all that good stuff you can find on doofmedia.com um, as well as the new place to find clues for the media md arg you can help us figure out just who is dr md and why are his bowling balls so sentient elliot why don't you tell the listeners this fortnight's clue receiver receiver and we'll see you next fortnight mm-hmm.